Does that work? Okay. okay. Sure. Hey, we're good on Facebook. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our January Thurston Regional, Plan er, Thurston Regional Planning Council meeting. Normally, I do not kick off the meetings, but this is not a normal meeting. Um, as folks know, January is a year where many, many of our members look at appointments and appoint and reappoint members to different committees. And this year we have a little more of um, past council members that have come off of council. And so we ended up with uh, our chair, vice chair and secretary all unable to, to attend this meeting. Um, and so I'm gonna take us through the introductions. And then after introductions, we're gonna elect, you're going to elect a chair pro tem for the meeting. And Dennis McVeigh from Rainier has volunteered to serve as that um, chair pro tem, but we'll take action on that after introductions. So I right now will will um, step through. I'll just call out the <clears throat> jurisdiction, and if you could introduce yourself, and um, and then <clears throat> Vina will handle the staff introductions. So I will start with Lacey. Uh, Malcolm Miller, Lacey City Council. Morning, Malcolm. Morning. Tom Water. Good morning. I'm Eileen Swarthout uh, from the city of Tumwater. And Thurston County. Uh, Gary Edwards. Morning, Gary. Morning. Um, and city of Rainier. Dennis McVeigh. City of Tenino. John O'Callaghan from the great city of Tenino. And Yelm. Uh, North Thurston Public Schools. Uh, Dean Martin Olich. Tom Water School District. Uh, Mel Murray, Director of Facilities. Uh, Olympia School District. Hi, Hillary Seidel, member of the Olympia School District Board of Directors. Inner City Transit. Carolyn Cox. Uh, Lacey Fire District 3. Hello, Rick Kelly. And the Evergreen State College. Kyle Morgan with Evergreen. And Thurston Economic Development Council. Good morning, Michael Cade. And now I'm scanning quickly to make sure. Okay, I think I've got everyone and I'll kick off the staff introductions because we've got a new staff person that I want to introduce council to. <coughs> Um, Casey Mock just joined us. She just started this week as an assistant planner, and she came to us most recently from the city of Yelm. Um, she's a Western Washington University graduate uh, in geography, and we've got her set up to work on a whole bunch of different projects for us. She'll be working on climate. She'll be working on a lot of different things. Um, and so we're, we're just really pleased to uh, have brought Casey on. So Casey, would you like to say hello quickly? Sure, hello everyone. Very happy to be here. Happy to listen in and learn from all of you. And yeah, excited to be working here. And we're excited to have her on. Uh, it's, she's gonna be a great addition. I'm, I'm looking forward to you all meeting her. Um, so Vina, if you could uh, take us over. Yeah, and I noticed that we've had our conservation district member oh. um, join us. Helen, would Morning, you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, it's Helen from the, I'm one of the, on the board of supervisors of the conservation district. Yeah. Sorry, late. Okay, as far as staff go, um, for TRPC staff, I'm Vina Tappet, the deputy director here. We have Karen Parkhurst, Berlina Lucas, Katrina Van Every, Paul Brewster, Dave Reed, Teresa Julius, Casey Mock, and um, Amy hatch -Winnica. I think I've caught everyone. From Inner City Transit, we have Ann Freeman Manzanares and Eric Phillips. From the City of Lacey, we have Martin Hoppe. And from the City of Olympia, we have Joyce Phillips. If I missed anyone, please let me know. As you were talking, I saw Mary Heather Ames from Tumwater came in as well. Great. Thank you. 
All right, so now we will be looking to elect a chair pro tem for this meeting. And so, as I mentioned, um, Dennis McVeigh from Rainier has, has volunteered to do that. So I'd be looking for a motion to elect a chair pro tem. Could you go ahead, just and, and, um, and, and just state what the motion is, John? Uh, move to accept Dennis McVeigh as a pro tem. Great. Gary Edwards, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> All right, Chair Dennis McVeigh. Thank you so much, Dennis, for being willing to, to chair today. All right. Um, good morning, <clears throat> Council, and thank you. Uh, it's been a been a long time since I was chair, but uh, we'll we'll get through this. We have a fairly busy and important schedule. Primarily our 2022 budget. Without approving that, we're kind of dead in the water. So I would entertain a motion for approval of our agenda. So entertain for approval of the agenda, John O'Callaghan. Yeah. Edward, second. Okay. Any discussion? Are all those in favor signify by saying aye? Aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you, Council. Agenda is approved. I look for a motion to approve the consent calendar. Uh, Edwards. Did, did you get that, Dennis? I did, yes, Gary. Okay. Thank you. Second, Hillary Seidel. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. <clears throat> and, and Chair, we did not have anyone sign up for public comment this morning. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that message. So too bad. It'd be nice to have some people. Okay, we'll move on to other business. Right away, we'll start with the important stuff, the TRPC operating budget. Hi, so good morning. Um, I'm Vina Tabbitt again, the Deputy Director here at TRPC. And once a year, we bring to you our annual operating budget. This is um, a requirement, of course, of a public agency. And so we very much appreciate you making the effort to make this meeting and giving us a quorum so we can get this business item underway for our new year. So our operating budget, um, there's a few things I just want to point out in our operating budget. Um, so you all have gone through our work program, or those of you that were on our board in the last year went through our work program and essentially reviewed our revenues. So that's the revenue side of our um, operating budget. As far as the expenditure side, some of the things I want to point out are um, one is that our staffing levels are about the same as last year. We do have a half FTE full-time equivalent a position planned um, in case we become a transportation management area and need to bring in some more transportation planning expertise. We're budgeting that at a fairly high level because that's a big transition for us. And for those of you new to the council, if we become, um, if our urban area, which is a very strange geography, reaches a certain threshold of 200,000 people, in this last census, and we're just waiting for those numbers, they should be out in the next couple of months, then our transportation um, responsibilities shift a little bit and we get more transportation responsibilities essentially, kind of up our game there. And there's a lot of hoops and whistles we have to go through. So we're just being proactive about thinking about that possibility. It looks like we probably will, but we won't know until everything settles from the census. Um, also within there is a 4% cost of living adjustment for staff salaries. It's um, a little bit higher. Last year we went quite minimal because of the pandemic. So, but with, um, so we're recommending just a slightly bit higher than the average of all our um, surveyed members. And mainly because we're seeing a lot of staff turnover across the country. They're calling it the great resignation. And we just wanna make sure we're doing our best to retain staff. As you all know, from your responsibilities at your um, jurisdictions, training staff and bringing them in is quite costly. So it's actually a cost savings over time we feel. 
And then we're um, also recommending including the new holiday that the state approved for state employees last year, Juneteenth. And so that's wrapped into our um, pay and classification plan and our staff salaries. And other things to look at in expenditures, um, our insurance has gone up quite a bit. It's not a huge item, but um, I just wanna point that out. It's harder and harder for our risk pool. We're with the Washington Cities Insurance Authority for them to um, get good insurance rates. And there's just a lot of things going on in the insurance industry. So that's something we're keeping an eye on um, and really proactively just thinking about. Another thing there is they, we, while our insurance rates went up, they dropped our cybersecurity coverage and raised our deductible. So then another line item that went up this year is our information technology. We still um, are recommending a robust investment in our IT infrastructure and our services to shore up our both shore up our cybersecurity for the agency, as well as um, ensure that our folks can continue to telework with all the right equipment and. Um, services that they need to do that given the pandemic. So those are the highlights of the budget and I'm happy to take questions and then we are looking for action from you. John O'Callaghan. Thank you. Uh, as far as the, as far as the 4% uh, pay increase, uh, some people might say that that's uh, a little bit on the high side. Uh, my question is, knowing what's happening with our economy throughout the United States right now, and we just hit 7% inflation, is that 4% really going to bite into that so that our people aren't trying to, trying to fudge on their own personal stuff to make it through? And I think this is more of a question for everybody since we're voting on that budget right now. I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, that is something we discussed because it, the the data shows that that even a four percent isn't going to necessarily keep up with inflation, and yet um, we in coming up with our uh, proposed cost of living, we survey um, our member organizations and no other organization. Many others are at four percent but we didn't see any that went above 4%. And so we did not feel comfortable proposing uh, anything above four, but you're absolutely right that it's quite possible that that doesn't fully um, account for increases in the cost of living. And the reason that I bring it up is just looking at my own personal, uh, the company I work for have been very, very generous for with me. And uh, the last pay increase that I got got eaten up the following month. And I and it maybe were you looking at comparable size? Because if I remember correctly, we're the smallest MPO in, in uh, the state. You know, the, more, the bigger the population, the easier it is to absorb uh, pay increases. So we um so when we do our salaries, we look at comparable organizations. Um, when we do our cost of living, we look at, look at our members. So it's really what your organizations have been um, giving. Okay. Again, this is, this is something more for you guys because I'm brand new to this organization. I've been the alternate for a long time and watching in every now and then. Uh, but it's just a question I thought needed to be asked and maybe make an adjustment on that to maybe 5%, uh, even though we are a smaller jurisdiction. Uh, I, it, it will help, I think, in a long, long range with uh, in, uh, retention. And even at 5%, I don't see that really digging too, helping too much with the inflationary rate that we're at right now. Uh, the other question that I have is, it, uh, if I heard you read uh, correctly, Vina, uh, we're losing our, our uh, coverage for cyber hacking stuff like that Am I, did i hear that no it's just okay. reduced um we still have coverage it's just not as um solid as it was last year uh, i think the, the the amount they reimbursed us per incident has decreased and our du deductible has increased but it is definitely something we're looking at and seeing if we can find another source to supplement things like that Okay, because I think that's going to be extremely important in the, in the years coming. I talked to Mark the other day about something that I just uh, found out about, and it's called AI poisoning, 
Uh, we don't have uh, artificial intelligence yet, but we are eventually going to have to move into that direction and we're going to have to make sure that we're protected on stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Other questions or comments? Chair, Mr. Chair, you might you might not see Mr. Chair. Um, Rick Kelly has his hand up. Yeah, I did not see him. Please, Rick. It just um, uh, just stemming off of John's comment on insurance, and I didn't check the year over year cost, and I realized the insurance um, is a relatively small portion of the budget. Um, could you just quantify the increase in insurance, or is that just a monitor uh, monitor task for the staff going forward? Um, I don't have the number in the top of my head. I think it went up maybe four to 5,000. It's small in our budget. It's just important in the implications, I think is why I pointed it out. No, that's great. Thanks for bringing that up. Nothing further. Uh, John, I, appre <clears throat> I appreciate your comments. Uh, personally, I think our staff is worth more than we pay them for what they do for our region. Uh, but if, if you're proposing that we go above 4%, then you would have to do that in the form of a motion. That was or, next. Hmm? That was next. Okay. So I, I, I am proposing that we go at least 5%. Uh, as as uh, Dennis said, I've known uh, Vina from the other side of the transportation policy board side and Karen, and these guys just do phenomenal work. Uh, I, I think the 5% in this day and age uh, for retention and to help with uh, the rising cost of everything that we're seeing, uh, I, I think that's even under fair, but it will help a little bit. Uh, Dennis, could I make some mention on something? Absolutely, Commissioner. Uh, I, I kind of missed something here. Did, did you, uh, are we doing something with the CPI? Is that, and has that, is that officially out at a certain rate or something now? Um, so thank you, Commissioner Edwards. We do not benchmark to the CPI, although um, we certainly monitor it for other reasons. We benchmark to what our members give as their cost of living increase. And so that's how we do our survey. Okay, because I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking that we're gonna have some very serious inflation and i don't know that five percent is going to cover it so that's all that was my question thank you very much thank you commissioner i have one other so, question uh halfway through the year can we readjust and start at five percent and if it really skyrockets the way it's being predicted can we uh, readdress that the pay increase yes absolutely we can bring a budget um, adjustment to you halfway through the year Okay, good to know. Thank you. Okay, so I think we've had sufficient. Uh, Hillary, I, I, I see Hillary's hand. And, and then yeah. Mayor Joe DePento and then as well. Joe, yeah, Joe, Joe DePento. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess my question, like, first off, thank you very much to everyone who worked, I'm sure, very hard on preparing a budget for us um, that felt um, sufficient to meet the needs of the organization. And, and my question is more, I don't want to put staff on the spot, but if, if the council votes, is this something that you're able to easily incorporate into the budget or would you need to take the budget back and make adjustments other places? Because, um, that, that concerns me. Um, so I don't know, Vina or Mark, I hate to put you on the spot. I'm so sorry. Oh, you're, you're not because I've already texted Vina and, and asked just that question um, yeah. because it will have budget implications because we, we didn't work a scenario with a 5%. And so um, it, it, it wouldn't mean that that it couldn't be done, but we certainly would need to go back to the budget and, and, and see how to, I mean, we could still take action today, but then we would need to, to at some point probably bring back to you some revisions that, that account for how we're going to incorporate that extra 1%. Yeah, so if you were to take that action, I would suggest that you adopt I'm, I'm, my head has been spinning about how to address this too. Thank you, Hillary. Um, we, you could just adopt the budget with the amendment of the 5% and direct staff to make the necessary adjustments to revenues and expenditures because 
it would bring in a little bit more project money as well. So we'd make adjustments on both ends. So, and then we could um, perhaps just bring it back as consent next, next month so you could see the adjustments. Okay, I, you know, I, here's, here's what I will say. Um, I, I trust that the folks who have put together the budget have thought through these really tricky questions um, and that they're looking at what the cost of living increases are in our region. And I would caution us about trying to amend the budget um, in this way um, as a council. Um, maybe this is a good conversation for how we give staff direction when preparing the budget um, in the future. And if we can amend the budget midway through the year, I think maybe that would be the better approach if we see some challenges going forward. Um, but, but I think the other really important issue to bring up, um, if I can give props to the organization, is that people are also making decisions to leave and go other places because of the quality of the work environment. And we've seen over and over again through staff surveys that staff have great confidence in the leadership here um, and that people feel um, uh, happy working here. And so I, I think this is a bigger picture than just adding 1% to the cost of living increase. And, and I, I would feel uncomfortable trying to budget in the middle of a meeting. That's just me. I, you, I think that. Oh, okay. Hey, Dennis. Yes, uh, Commissioner. I, I, I think I kind of agree for the sake of simplicity that maybe that's the way we should go, and then we can always address it later on. Thank you, Mayor DePinto. Thank you. Uh, so, looking through the um, the briefing with the budget and everything, I, I I'd love to give them five, ten, fifteen, twenty percent. You know, of course they're well worth it. Of course. But having gone through these, um, I just went through a Teamsters union negotiation just uh, last week and we just secured that. And, you know, these other cities, um, City of Olympia at 4%, at Lot 4%, Lacey 3 to 4 I mean, this is, if you're suggesting you go higher than that, I mean, that, that's really, I mean, that, that's great and everything. But I, I just don't understand. We were already at the top of that list for everybody. We're already at that 4%. Yelm is probably going to be hitting about close to 4% in our, in our negotiations. We're tying ours to CPI, but I mean, it's already been done. It seems like it's a lot of work to create these budgets. They're not just thrown willy nilly together like this. I, I mean, it's almost a slap in the face of the people who've been putting this together of all the hard work that they've been doing to, to come in in this last minute and say, well, let's push it up a little bit. Let's do this. Let's do that. I mean, I, I understand I'm new to these meetings and this committee and everything, but I like to go ahead and move forward with what it is right now. Um, and I, I don't know if there's a, a motion on the floor, but it, it, is there a chair a motion currently? There is, yes. <clears throat> John O'Callaghan made a motion to raise the COLA to 5%. And uh, actually, I think that motion is now dead because we received no second. Yeah, lack of it dies for lack of a second. Yeah. Uh, so, John, 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 uh, please. Go ahead. <clears throat> so there is no second. So the motion is dead. That motion amendment is dead. There is still a motion on the floor to approve the 2022 operating budget with a four percent call. Who me? Who me? It would be nice to go higher. But my question is, wouldn't we just be adding to the inflationary spiral by doing that without some fair sure. thought and work by staff? Sure, I don't believe there was a motion to, uh, to approve it. I, 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 I don't believe we did have a, a motion for the, the budget on, it, on its face. But if I may, Chair, I, I would like to make a motion if that's... So, um so I would like the motion um, to reflect what's in the staff report because it's our budget and the wording is very important. So if you would entertain me on that one. So entertained. Second. Oh, well, someone no. needs to make the motion, but you have to read it into the record. And I'm trying yeah, to- How do you want it worded? 
Do you I have a right there under requested action? Approve okay. resolution. I approve resolution uh, 2022 01 adopting the 2022 Thurston Regional Planning Council consolidated operating budget and updates to the agency pay and classification. Can't see that last word. Plan. Thank you. Plan. Second. Second. Martha Miller. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve the 2022 budget. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you, Council. Thank and you. And I heard staff direction to um, keep an eye on things and perhaps propose a mid-year adjustment if necessary. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah, well, let's hope things get let's hope things get better and we don't have to do that yeah. and it's all not, right it's not that i'm that uh, i'm just wanting to throw money out of, out there or anything it's just that i've been here since 96 and i've watched these people do just amazing work for us yeah okay so let's let's move on that was a good discussion now we have a call for written officer nominations for 2022 and, and so, I, um, Mr. Chair, just to, to help set the context for that. So um, each year we, we do elections of a chair, vice chair and secretary. Um, uh, oftentimes per the bylaws, people serve in, in those positions for, for two years, but we do the elections every year. And um, as I mentioned at the start of the meeting, we uh, with retirements, we had um, two of our, our uh, officers that are that are now off of council. And so, um, but Clark Gilman, council member from Olympia has agreed, he's currently secretary. He has agreed to um, put his, his name in for vice chair, uh, but right now it is a clear slate for chair and for secretary. Incredibly important positions for us. Um, the, we, we meet on a monthly basis with as uh, the officers with me, as we set the agenda for future meetings, talk about issues that are going on with the, with the uh, organization and in the region. Um, so for the most part, the responsibilities are for the secretary. They also um, review and approve our, our vouchers. Um, vice chair, primarily it's those agenda setting meetings and filling in for the chair and the chair, obviously it is uh, setting the agendas, working closely with me, um, a very important position for us. And so um, for those that are, that are new, the way we do this is over the next month, hopefully we will be receiving written nominations to, to go to Berlina Lucas for um, any of those three positions any and all of those three positions. And then we will take a vote at the next meeting in February. And prior to that vote, we will also take nominations from the floor. Okay. So any please questions? submit your written nominations or be ready to give a verbal nomination at our next meeting. It, it, and as Mark said, these are very important positions. I mean, Realistically, the staff could handle everything without us, but it's nice that we're there <clears throat> at the same time. Does All right, I depend on our officers greatly. I, I, yeah. uh, yeah, I so um, please, I encourage folks to, to put your name in if you have any uh, interest in, in working with us on this. Mark, okay. what, does the, what does the secretary do? Uh, the secretary reviews our, um, all our finances and approves our vouchers. Any further questions or discussion about nominations for officer positions? All right, moving on, we'll go into high capacity transportation Helen. committee appointment. Helen Wheatley. Hi, Helen, yes. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, Mark, is there a list of, at this point of who all the members of the council are? Um, because it might be useful to have a list like that when thinking about nominations. Yes, um, and it's constantly being updated because right now we, we 
we have, oh, you can't see it. Uh, we have some blank spaces on it because as I mentioned at the top of the meeting, we still have organizations that are that are working through their appointments. Um, so we, uh, we can certainly in the after meeting summary include the current list, but know that it, it will be changing a little bit over the next week or two as, uh, as our members solidify their, their committee assignments. Well, if you could maybe send us an update um, once once it's solid, that will do. Probably be even the most useful. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Good point. <clears throat> okay. High capacity transportation. That's Katrina. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so we are TRPC is embarking on a high capacity transportation study. Uh, as you know, our region is growing pretty significantly. Uh, we are facing the possibility of becoming a transportation management area, which is a federal designation, which opens up additional responsibilities and funding. Um, Inner City Transit has been embarking on some uh, uh, more high, higher capacity transportation with the one, and they're looking to really up that and ramp that over the next few years as we both recover from COVID, but also to, to meet what they, their benchmarks are. Um, and so TRPC has some learning to do. We are uh, needing to update or understand what the processes are as uh, more uh, opportunities for funding become available. We need to know what's the right steps to go through in order to make ourselves um, as an agency uh, competitive to receive funding to support high capacity transportation in our region. And so uh, this, that's what this study is all about. So as part of that study, it does call for the formation of a steering committee made up of uh, transportation policy board and council members. Uh, so as we've thought about this at the very beginning of this project, what we'd like to see happen is that we have a steering committee made up of six members from Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, Thurston County, Inner City Transit, and Yelm. Uh, because these are the areas that are going to be impacted most by high capacity transportation. Uh, and so we want to make sure that as we're learning and growing and understanding what we need to do moving forward, um, these are the agencies that are going to be best suited to help um, guide that process. Uh, so we recognize again that not everyone, not the TPB and Council boards are not settled yet uh, because we are at the start of the year. Um, so we are just asking for a motion uh, to approve the formation of a subcommittee uh, and that uh, recognizing that those are the, the partners that we're asking to be part of that. And as those boards and commissions um, uh, fill and get their assignments, um, kind of working with those agencies to see who would be able to step up and fill that role. Um, Mark, anything else to add? No, I, I think that's it. Aside from, so today the action we're looking for is the, the uh, approval to set up the subcommittee comprised of uh, a, a member from each of Olympia, Tumwater, Lacey, Thurston County, Inner City Transit, and Yelm. And then um, in my executive director's report at, in the February meeting, I'll tell you who those actual members that were selected, one from each of those jurisdictions were. No approval. John O'Callaghan. Move to approve the formation of a subcommittee to act as a steering committee for the high capacity transportation study. Malcolm Miller. Thank you, Malcolm. Second, Hillary Seidel. Okay, we have a motion in a second to approve establishment of a subcommittee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Council. Now, Puget Sound Regional Council and Growth Policy Board Management member appointment. Okay, so um, we've talked about this be before. Um, so because our two regions, the Puget Sound Regional Council, they, their jurisdiction is King County, Snohomish, Pierce, and Kitsap. Um, and our two organizations long ago recognized how interlinked we are. And so they are uh, ex officio members of, of our council and we are the same for theirs. 
Um, we, we've been a little more active participants in Puget Sound Regional Council, including the, the Growth Management Policy Board. We've had member on, on that, that board for quite some time. Um, Helen Wheatley has, uh, is currently the alternate. Cynthia Pratt was our, our representative and, and is no longer on council. Um, Helen Wheatley is our alternate and has a, expressed willingness to, to serve as the prime. Um, and, and so what we're looking for is identification of a, a prime member and an alternate. And the Puget Sound Regional Council Growth Management Policy Board um, meets once a month. They're currently um, meeting remotely. Uh, if and when th they return to um, in-person meetings, um, it, travel costs are, are, are covered for that. Okay. I would entertain a motion to establish that or to accept appointments. I think it's to accept appointments. I move that uh, we move forward to find replacements uh, for the was it Pierce Transit? No, it's it's Puget no. Sound Regional Puget Council. Puget Sound Regional. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mark, Mark used my voice very well in his in uh, the motion to accept this. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Is the motion to appoint Helen? And, and I, I, it'd be good if we could write, uh, identify an Do it all at once. Is there, possible. so Mark, is there anyone who's indicated an interest in being the alternate? I have not heard of anyone yet who, who will serve as an alternate. I can serve as an alternate. Thank you, Mayor. So it, it, that was Mayor Joe DePinto. Who volunteered to serve as an alternate? Correct. Okay, so I'm going to accept that we have a motion for uh, the primary and the alternate. Is that correct? Do we have a second for that? Uh, second, Hillary Seidel. Okay, thank you, Hillary. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you for the volunteers and good luck. All right, next item. Sanctioned and redistributed federal funding programming. And that's Vina again. Hi, so um, I'm really excited about this presentation or this agenda item. And I know Mark and Karen and Paula are as well. Um, so Berlina, can you forward the PowerPoint? So I'm here to talk to you about some funding that we received and um, how we, Berlina, can you um, go oh. to the next slide, please? Thanks. Yes. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about some funding that we received and how we plan to um, get it out on the street. So last fall, we were notified, notified that we received $1.58 $1 5, $1 million in sanctioned and redistributed federal funds. Um, when I use the word sanctioned, the sanctions came from other um, organizations within the state, including the Washington State Department of Transportation, that were not able to meet something called their obligation target, the target that we all aim for each year to get funds under contract. And redistributed funds are the same, but they come from other states. And so there was a certain amount of funding received. Um, across the state and then given out to different organizations that were able to meet their obligation target. And we were one of those. And that, um, for those of you that have been on the board or our transportation policy board know that that's one of the things we strive for every year and we've done a really good job at meeting our targets. The caveat is this funding will raise our next year's target. So um, therefore we need to approve a list of projects so that we can meet our target next year, therefore not get sanctioned and perhaps poise ourselves to get more additional funding. So this is over and above our normal funding and it's just a great um, piece of news for our region. So what I'm here today is to talk to you about the list of projects and how we develop them um, and also our strategy for moving forward to come to get potential additional federal funds. Okay, next slide please, Marlena. So, it, this is short notice um, for those of you that have been involved in when we program out federal funds. And I wanna take a step back and say these federal funds 
are programmed out for transportation funds um, throughout the region, and they include a variety of funds, a variety of projects from programs to transit projects to construction projects. Just um, and there's kind of an eligibility list, but last time we did what we call our call for projects, we asked for a list of projects. We also asked for a list of contingency projects from our project partners. And um, because we thought, well, we knew that we would be um, potentially in the situation where we get funding at short notice and need to program out to funds quickly. And you also, the council and policy board also adopted something called an obligation authority policy that laid out what to do in this situation. So we were really thinking ahead and that's great news. Um, so we confirmed with all our partners um, from this list of contingency projects, which included some new projects as well as projects that already had federal funding on them. And which ones were ready to go this year because the caveat is if they receive funding they need to get that under contract by june 3rd july 30th of this year we received um, a request for five million dollars of projects for the 1.58 million that's you know i know that sounds like it, that's a problem but really that's great news and you'll see why later it, because we're ready to go and if there's any more funding we have our list ready to go and I just want to say all of this is just it takes a tremendous amount of work by all of our partners, mainly your transportation engineering and planning staff. None of it's easy to get these projects moving and get them moving in a timely fashion. And we have been just a great job as a region to meet our targets and get projects moving on the ground. Um, <clears throat> okay, so our proposal today is to do a distribution of that 1.5 million out of that 5 million list based on our past practice of setting funding levels based on uh, formula of vehicle miles traveled and transit ridership. We also are taking into account that we need a rural minimum um, set aside. That's a federal requirement every time we program out money that a certain amount has to go to rural areas or rural projects. And Thurston County proposes both urban projects and rural projects. It's the urban rural definition is um, very specific. And then if a project partner um, put in more than one project and some of our partners did, we asked them to prioritize so that we could give the available funding to their top priority. Our funding strategy was reviewed and um, recommended by our technical advisory committee. That's a committee made up of um, our partner, uh, engineers and transportation planners. And then it was reviewed and recommended by the Transportation Policy Board at their meeting this Wednesday. Okay, so next slide, please, Berlina. So the other thing that you'll notice in the staff report is a B list. Well, the B list is a project list that we're setting up for potential 22 redistributed funds. So in June of this year, Washington State Department of Transportation staff are going to come to us or we'll go to them and they'll um, provide a list that says, hey, we have this list of ready to go projects that can get their projects, the funding under contract by September of 2022. Go ahead, feel secure that we're able to do this and go ask for redistributed funds from other states. If they're ready to do it, and um, it's quite complicated, it depends on how everyone else is doing, it's not just us, we're one of many partners trying to hit these targets, but if they're ready to do it, then there's a great, greater likelihood that those funds will go directly to those projects. So that's what we're calling our B list. And from now on, we're gonna generate this B list and submit them annually from now on. So we're gonna always be a little bit ahead of the game instead of having to come back and program out the funding once we develop it. Our li this list will be developed. Um, we're expecting to do our next call for projects in the fall. So from now on, we'll develop that list, but we'll, there'll be a chance to put new projects on it for next year. Okay, next slide, please. So our next steps uh, today, we're asking for council approval under our obligation authority. We pre-approved that this could come to you in one step, not two steps like our normal approval process. Then we'll submit funding letters to our partners. We, um, our staff will make the necessary amendments to our regional state transportation improvement plan that could take one or two months, um, depending on the complexity of the project. The A list of projects that receive funding um, will obligate by July 2022. We have checked and double checked with our partners that all these projects are ready to go. But if one were to slide, then we would just pull, um, give the funding to another project that's ready to go. So we make sure that we hit that target and we have a full process in place for that. 
And then um, that B project list will be submitted to DOT, like I mentioned, and hopefully we'll receive funding and able to get those out to our partners and under contract by September of 2022. So with that, I will take any questions. And Berlina, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. I have a quick question, Vina. Yeah. Um, we, uh, in 2021, we received that report about um, you know, the sidewalks and what, you know, areas were deficient and uh, the the lack of and, you know, the prioritizing, you know, sidewalks near schools and walking path for kids and stuff like that. Um, does any of that work qualify? Um, sidewalks are absolutely qualified projects. We just didn't have any ready to go in such a short time framework. So there weren't any on this particular list but we expect to see a lot of projects like that submitted in the next call for projects. And we certainly have funded those in the past. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Just a quick question and apologies if I missed this in the, in the written documents or in your brief, Vina. How does this, um, crosswalk against the legislative priority, the uh, I-5 corridor priority? So the I-5 pr priority, we're asking for state funding to continue working on that. That is not the type of project we typically fund through these projects. It's much larger and requires much more funds. Um, we will certainly be asking for federal funds for that as well, but more um, specific dedicated funds. We have funded out of this pot some of the planning work um, for I-5 in the past, but um, there were that was not part of this call for projects. Just the magnitude is so much different than what we're able to program out of, the, out of this pot. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, well, this is an action item. So I would uh, entertain a motion. So entertained, move approval of, uh, can you put the wording up so I can just read it? <laughs> um, I can say it for you, John, if that Thank would you. work. That to approve work. the funding strategy as outlined in the staff report and then direct staff to issue award letters. Bet you guys didn't know my voice could get that high, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's the motion. Second, Malcolm Miller. Okay, thank you, Malcolm. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 Or, or yes. aye. <laughs> okay. Opposed? All right. Motion passes. Thank you all. And Gary, I see your face. Did you have a comment? Uh, no, sir. I was just following directions. So I said yes. So it must have picked up something different. No, I just popped your picture <laughs> up in the middle of the screen. Okay, okay. great. Good. Night. All right. Thank you. Moving on, our next item is TRPC values, vision, and mission. And this is primarily a discussion and action. Central action item, yes. Real, just briefly before I, I go into that discussion, um, I just wanna recognize again, $1.58 million came to our region that was kind of quote, quote unquote unexpected, uh, again, because all of you, your staff, all of our st staff people throughout this region have done such an excellent job of working through these federal funding processes that we hit the mark, we hit our targets, and that's what made this possible. It's that's big. And I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to recognize that because I'm very excited about the action that, that council just took. So thank you all. Okay. I am going to talk uh, about our retreat again. And so I am going to take a little bit of a, a step backwards because we've got some folks that weren't involved in uh, the council retreat in July. So just at, by way of some background, um, our, our, our council and in, in your bylaws, we hold a, a biennial retreat um, to help chart the course of the organization. And our past retreat was in this summer of 2021 uh, in person in Yelm. 
Um, and at that retreat, council wanted to take a little bit of a step back. Um, in the, the previous two retreats, we'd really focused on the strategic plan for the organization. And what council, the council's direction for this retreat was, we're quite comfortable with the strategic plan. We'd like to, to talk a little bit more, take a step back again and, and talk about why we all come together as a region to plan around the Thurston Regional Planning Council table. Um, what are, what's that vision for our future? What are those values, shared values that we hold? And then how, how does that impact the, the mission of the organization? And so those were the points of emphasis for our retreat. In October of 2021, uh, council considered uh, drafts of those value statements, vision, and mission, and, and approved the mission statement and vision statement at that October meeting, but directed uh, staff, directed me to convene a subcommittee uh, to look specifically at the diversity, equity, and inclusion value statement. Uh, we made some changes to the to the other value statements. Folks were pretty comfortable with the others, but wanted to put some more emphasis on the diversity, equity, and inclusion value statement, and propose updated language to council. And that's what that's what we'll be doing today. But before that, again, because there are are folks that weren't there, and um, I, I I will stop prefacing this soon with I know that it's lengthy. Um, but every time I read this, it, it does, it feels right. I, I really like what council came up with on, on this. And so I'm going to take the, take the time to, to read this, uh, the vision adopted vision for our organization is that the Thurston region will become a model for sustainability and livability. Our residents will enjoy accessible, efficient, and effective multimodal transportation, on a system that is integrated regionally, maintained for longevity, and minimizes its impact on the region's environment. Our collective work will preserve environmental quality, consume less energy and water, sustainably use lands, produce less waste, and advance our climate targets. We will support our economic development partners to foster a vibrant economy. Our actions will enhance an excellent education system, cultivate a healthy environment and foster a diverse, inclusive and equitable community that remains affordable and, liv and livable. We will think in generations, not years. The region will work together toward common goals, making decisions with integrity and holding ourselves accountable to all Thurston region residents. And when I think of our work, um, I, I personally, that's, that's the vision I have for, for the work we do together. So I, I very much appreciate councils uh, establishing that vision for us. And then our mission uh, is to provide visionary collaborative leadership on regional plans, policies, and issues for the benefit of all Thurston Region residents. And to support this mission, we conduct regional transportation planning consistent with state and federal requirements, address growth management, environmental quality, economic opportunity, and other topics to sustain and enhance the region's quality of life. We assemble and analyze data that support informed local and regional decision-making, act as a convener to build regional consensus on issues through information and inclusive public involvement, and build intergovernmental consensus on regional plans, policies, and issues in support of local implementation. Those are that's our established mission statement and vision statement. And then, we also uh, looked at five values. Um, and as I mentioned, it was the diversity, equity, and inclusion value that uh, council directed us to, to do a little more work on. And so we convened a subcommittee that uh, was uh, Chair J.W. Foster, Malcolm Miller, Hillary Seidel, and Chris Stearns. We met in December. Um, prior to that meeting, I, I, I did some searching of other value statements on diversity, equity, and inclusion and provided a, a 10 or so examples to, to the subcommittee. We had a lot of great discussion on, on this and actually they pulled some from some of those statements, but a lot of this came from, from our members themselves. Um, what you see at the bottom with strike through, I just wanted you to be able to, to 
refer back to what was discussed in October. What you see in strike through at the bottom is, is what, uh, uh, what I put forward um, for council consideration in, in October and what our subcommittee is um, recommending is diversity, equity, and inclusion. We seek to address systemic racism in all intersections of repression and promote policies that account for inequities in our community. We accept our responsibility to make the Thurston region a community where our, all people are welcomed, secured, secure, and valued. Um, TRPC will promote policies and conduct that reflect a commitment to and accountability for racial and social justice equality. And so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to pause there and, and first um, ask if any of the subcommittee members, um, Malcolm Miller and Hillary Seidel, are in attendance, if, if they'd like to speak to the work of our subcommittee. Okay, um, then uh, let's open this up to council discussion on this proposed uh, change to the diversity, equity, and inclusion value statement. And to facilitate discussion, I am going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, council Member DePinto. Thank you. Uh, has this been an issue of um racial equity and social equity or social justice equity for um, this organization? I'm sorry, I just didn't hear the first part of what, what you asked. Sure, has this been an issue for this um, this council? Where we're, uh, not, we're not doing these things already? It, it's not necessarily that we aren't doing these things. It's the discussion at the retreat was, this was an area of emphasis for council and uh, and wanted to reflect that in our in the values that we bring that that we bring to this table. Is there a specific action that's going to be um, that's going to come of this? Well, it, as staff, we will be, I will be looking to make sure that we're tying our work programs, our our budgets, our project proposals to be in keeping with our vision, mission, and values. So it helps kind of provide that compass. Um, for for staff as, as we work to support the council. Thank you. Hey, council Mark. member Seidel. Hillary. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Dennis. Uh, Hillary. Yeah, I, I apologize. I probably should have mentioned this earlier or asked this. Mark, can you remind, especially for folks who are new to council, what the other value statements we agreed? So this is not the, for Mayor DePinto, this is not the only value statement. It's just the one that we wanted to do a little extra work on to make sure that we got it right. Yes. So. And, and so I have those teed up um, because if we got through this part, we were going to go through the rest. So I'll go ahead and share my screen quickly. And we can look at those other uh, value statements so that folks have that, that context as well. So uh, accountability, we're responsible to each other and the Thurston region residents. We conduct equitable, objective, impactful, and timely transportation, land use, community, and environmental planning. Integrity, we are stewards of the region's land use and transportation interests. We deliver on our promises, are transparent in our decisions, efficiently use funding, are guided by ethics and fairness, and we adapt to changing information and circumstances. And sustainability. Our region's quality of life stems from our environment. We strive to preserve, protect, and enhance the built and natural environments of the region for the benefit of generations to come. And collaboration. We come together around shared interests and work strategically together across disciplines and jurisdictional boundaries to identify opportunity, opportunities, address gaps, and implement strategies. And I'll stop sharing. Helen. Yeah, um, in response to Joe's question, maybe a couple of examples of how that language, um, you know, a reason why that language came forward, um, we could think about, for example, there was a lot of discussion about how surveys are conducted. 
and making sure that um, all voices are heard or every that there's good outreach um, for surveys that TRPC does. So, I mean, that's just an example of uh, how and why that language could have kind of an immediate effect of integrating into, into what TRPC, how TRPC does its planning. Um, I just wanted to bring that up as a kind of an immediate example because that came up uh, when we were talking about the, um, you know, the, I forget the name of, the, Mark, maybe you can remind me, but when we were talking about the survey that was done on the, on the trails, uh, the bicycle trails. Yes. Last year. I mean, that was, there was a lot of discussion around oh, yes. mm -hmm. how to, how to design the survey in a way that, that reaches everybody. So I just wanted to bring that up as an example of why, why that could be immediately useful and why it's good to have it integrated in, into the language. Well, Andy, you'll hear some uh, about that in uh, our next presentation, actually. And, and the other part of it is, is just putting an equity, equity lens on policy uh, so that we get more input from areas that we normally don't see, or where, we, you know, where we feel like there's there's a deficiency from this group of people or that group of people. And so we can put that equity lens on there by, you know, in, in an effort to be a little, I won't say a little more inclusive, but um, to broaden our reach. For and, under discussion. And Mr. Chair, if, if there isn't or when there isn't, um, it, it, it we would be looking for a council um, action to adopt the value statements, if, if possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So where are we calling? So just an observation. Um, <clears throat> it seems we're, we're we're trying to fit a lot of words um, into this one value statement as comparative to the others. Um, you know, if you if you look across all of our value statements, I, I think there's consistency in what we've what was included in some of the wording, one or two lines of what was recommended by the sub subcommittee. Um, but just the number of words alone, and I know that's not a true measure of the importance of of the uh, what we're trying to capture. Would lead you to believe that we're kind of overemphasizing or emphasizing this value um, over the other values. Just an observation. Thank you. Further discussion or comment? Uh, Dennis, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to, real quick, this doesn't, not much to it, just uh, whether there should be an S. On your second, uh, red line on your bullets on TRPC will promote policies and conduct that reflect. And I just wonder if that should say reflects. I don't know, I mean, just minor. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll check, we'll, we'll, ensure, we'll make sure that we've got the right S or no S, thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Further comment? All right, this is actually an action item. So I would entertain a motion. Move to adopt the value statements as presented by staff. Thank you, Hillary. Second. Thank you, Carolyn. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> we have an opposed? Uh, yes, Joe uh, DePinto, Chair. Okay. So we have predominant ayes. So the motion passes. Thank you, Council. And now we move on to our next agenda item, which is a break. And it is 9.34, so we're talking about being back at basically 9.39, five-minute break. Enjoy it, and we'll see you all back in just a few minutes.
Okay, I think we're back. Are we ready, Mark? We are ready are to go, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. Next item is the Transportation Priority Survey Process and Methods. And that's Katrina again. Thank you. Yes, you get two doses of me today. Uh, and so we are definitely talking about transportation and we're talking about priorities and we are talking about surveys. Um, and so as uh, the uh, Chair Pro Tem indicated, we're talking about methods this time. So generally when we go through surveys, uh, we report back on what we heard um, with all the questions. And today we're gonna to take a different tack and kind of step back and say, um, you know, how did we hear from people? Uh, and and what, how did we go about the survey process? And so it really begins with why did we even do this survey? And really the, the primary reason for the survey was to incorporate, oops, wrong direction, incorporate uh, equity more fully into our processes, especially the call for pro projects process that we have. Some other benefits include uh, really looking at telework and changing commute patterns. So we live in a time of COVID and things have changed a lot. And so we wanted to hear from people what, how, how that was, how they were experiencing that. And then the third piece is really, we wanted to look at testing our survey methods for surveying and gathering data. And we've heard over and over again that we need to hear from more and more people. So how are we going to be, how are we at doing that? And so this uh, priorities, uh, transportation priority survey asked a lot of different questions. Uh, it was conducted countywide between June and November of last year. And we began by sending a postcard to every household with an invitation to tell us what's important to them. And the postcard included language in both English and Spanish uh, and provided a link to the project website and a QR code to the online survey. So this was primarily conducted as an online survey. We asked about COVID and commuting, about transportation access and job access, about what people's priorities for uh, funding that we have available, uh, what kind of projects did they wanna see funded? What are their big picture values and how do they feel about equity and our desire to incorporate that more fully into our work? Uh, the Span Spanish, Korean, and Vietnamese are the three most common languages spoke at home besides English in Thurston County. And so we proactively had the survey translated into Spanish and included the invitation to take the survey in both English and Spanish. We also included language on the project website, and that's, this is kind of a snapshot of what we had up there in Korean and Viet Vietnamese that invited people who desired the survey uh, to be translated into another language to reach out to us. And I do want to just point out that this, this has been a very long process. As I mentioned, we kind of surveyed over six months of time. Uh, we included a lot of people. We heard from a lot of people through the survey effort, and it is in no small part uh, due to community partnerships. So many of these partners are represented or agencies on the council, but there are others that are trusted community organizations that don't sit on this council. Uh, who we work with on a regular basis. Uh, so we reached out to many more organizations than are what re are represented on the slide. And I just wanna take a moment to highlight a few. You know, we had people sharing social media posts, uh, emailing their staff and community members, mailing surveys uh, uh, with water and, and uh, invitations and water bills. And we had people getting the word out through a lot of different means. So uh, just a really big thank you to all these partner agencies and their staff because there's time involved in this that you know, we didn't have to take on, but other agencies did for us. So we, if we emailed, uh, or sorry, mailed this uh, invitation out to all households in Thurston County, who did we hear back from? We heard from 4,200 people through our general survey responses. Uh, we also conducted uh, a general survey 
sorry, in addition to the general survey, we also conducted a more targeted student survey that had fewer questions. And this was really geared towards Thurston County's high school students. And we invited all of the school districts to, or their students to participate through in that. We heard from about 500 students. Um, they're not actually reflected in the chart on the right because we didn't ask them demographic information. But I just wanna acknowledge that, uh, you know, we heard from both the Elm School District and Olympia School District. And while, you know, it, it, this is a time for schools that has been very difficult. And so we really do appreciate that we heard from two uh, diverse school districts in different parts of our community that represent both rural and urban areas. And so, uh, you know, that, that response rate is, is pretty phenomenal in my opinion. Um, and as part of that, we did ask people uh, to provide some demographic information. And so of those nearly 4,200 responses, we actually had a lot of people provide that background information. And that was pretty key for us as we have been going through and analyzing the data to make sure that um, we're, we're able to pull out what uh, people are saying. So uh, again, a really pheno phenomenal uh, rate of people who provided this information. And, and that's what has made it easier to kind of tease out differences that we might see um, in what people think based on their age, gender, and other demographic information. So we've heard over and over again that we really need to hear from more people when we survey or we need to find other methods where we can hear from more people in a more meaningful way. And so when we're talking about surveys, how many responses do we actually need in order to trust that the, these survey results represent the population? And so I just pulled some headlines uh, of different polls that have been done uh, in the nation. Um, and in this case, these surveys each match in way of responses to the population at, at large. So they have a lot, a lot more detailed formula for how these are conducted and they're very, very rigorous and controlled so that they can match that up to what the population thinks. And I think what's most important to note here is the percent of the total population the survey sampled. In each case, less than one one hundredth of a percent of the population are represented to provide insight into what the general population believes. So just so you know, these um, surveys are all linked in the presentation. So when you get that after um, the meeting, you can look those up. Now let's go ahead and look at the transportation priority survey. This is somewhat an apples and oranges comparison uh, to the previous slide because our results are based on people's self-reporting and self-reporting their demographics. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. That said, we're still talking about the same thing. We're still talking about fruit. We're asking the same information and using a different process to analyze it. Uh, so what's most important to note here is that the percent of the total population, uh, the survey sampled again. Uh, and in each case in these demographic splits, uh, more than five tenths of a percent of each demographic group is represented to provide insight into what that specific demographic population believes. It's much higher than the national surveys that we showed on the previous slide. I do wanna note um, on this slide, you'll see that we have people aged 10 to 24. So while over 83,000 Thurston County residents are 24 or younger, we recognize that the youngest uh, residents aren't going to be taking the survey. And taking into consideration the student survey responses, nearly all respondents, 24 and younger, were actually between the ages of 14 and 24. Unfortunately, we can't accurately track this age bracket at 14 to 24 because of the way the US Census Bureau reports age and because we didn't ask student survey respondents their age. What we do know is that nearly 50,000 people in Thurston County are between the ages of 10 and 24 and about 550 of these survey respondents were likely between the ages of 14 and 24. So I just wanna put that out front. So as part of this um, survey effort, we set up different collectors or different trackers to understand how people were accessing um, the survey. We really began the process again with that postcard mailing, inviting all how people in the community to um, participate in the online survey. 
And after that, we started doing some other things. So we had set up a collector that just um, started representing other people. So active transportation, just our general and Spanish um, survey collectors. We actually did some paper surveys that were um, distributed through Food Bank, the Housing Authority of Thurston County and the senior housing facilities. And then again, that student on online student survey. And so this is what, sh this is showing you where the percentage of, of responses came from. So nearly half of the responses for, uh, that we received actually uh, came in through that postcard mailing. Uh, but we also see that a good number of people uh, came in through our general uh, collector and our active transportation collector. Uh, so those are things, e uh, primarily email lists that we have or that we have with partners. Um, there are also our Facebook ads that we did during the process and also our employee transportation coordinators. So these are uh, the different agencies in the area that have to um, have, a, have a person designated to lead their commute trip reduction efforts. Um, this is also where we had Rainier and Tonina partner with us and provide a flyer in their water bills. Uh, where we sent out an additional mailing to Bukota residents and where the Chehalis tribe provided um, a link to the survey through their mailing list. So you can see a lot of different um, ways that people are accessing the survey. Uh, again, most prevalent was through that postcard mailing, but we had really good uh, response rates through other methods as well. Um, Another question that we ask ourselves and uh, get asked all the time is how do our response rates for various demographics compare to Thurston County's actual uh, population? And again, we were able to collect demographic information on a whole bunch of different aspects of people's lives. Um, we're gonna kind of streamline this and go over a few of them. So age, household income, race and ethnicity and disability affecting mobility. And so again, I'm gonna show you the comparison between what our county population is and what we heard from people. So in this one, talking about age, what we see is that people under the age of 55 are underrepresented in the survey results and people under the age of 24 are a lot more underrepresented. Um, if we pulled those student responses out from the total, uh, we only heard from 48 people from uh, between the ages of 10 and 24. So that's a 1% response rate. So this continues to be a demographic that's more difficult to reach um, and an area that we need to explore ways to improve that. Household income, again, what you see here is that people with household income less than 35,000 we're also underrepresented. We did pretty good for the, the mid-range folks with the mid-range household income and people with higher incomes are overrepresented. I just wanna note that most households at that, that lowest um, income level really struggle to make ends meet and transportation can be an issue for them. And so identifying ways that we can improve that uh, is really important. So we also asked about race and ethnicity. And what you see here again is that people of color are underrepresented in the survey. I do wanna give a shout out to the Chehalis tribe at this point in time. Um, we heard from a hundred people that are American Indian Alaska natives. And that is in due, that seems like a really small number uh, given that we have two tribes in the area but that is probably the best rate that we've had for a response from that demographic group. And it was in no small part because they emailed their staff and tribal members. And so we really, again, really appreciate those partnerships that help us hear from people in the community. And then finally, disability affecting mobility. So we asked people if they had a disability that affected how they got around by car, truck, bus, bicycling, or walking. And what this shows is that one in five respondents have a disability affecting their mobility. And the majority of those um, are affected uh, through their ability to walk or ride a bike. Um, car, yeah, I think it would be surprising for many of us to see how many people also are affected in their ability to use a car or drive a car or ride a bus. Um, but this just goes to show you that this is another area where 
um, having this information can help us better serve our community at large. So let's go back to that idea of those collectors. So again, collectors are how we understand how people accessed um, the, the survey. And so this shows how people access the survey based on those different demographics uh, that we just talked about. Um, as you can see, <laughs> the outlier here is the respondents age 10 to 24. The vast majority of those um, uh, accessed it through that student, student survey. Um, but when you look at the others, you see again, a, quite a few people accessed it through postcard mailing. Um, but that doesn't mean that our other efforts aren't also important. So we see a lot of people still coming in through um, those emails that we send out or our partners send out, as well as those paper surveys that we did with the food bank, the housing authority of Thurston County, and uh, through distri distributing those at senior uh, facility, living facilities. So um, I'm just gonna go over one of the questions that we asked in the survey, and that was about equity. Uh, we asked, uh, you, you heard earlier uh, in, or I guess that was last year, you heard last year about the equity goal that we were looking at incorporating um, into the regional transportation plan. And uh, you guys talked about that quite a bit. And so we also brought that to the public and asked whether how they felt about that. And what you see here is that, again, there's pretty common, uh, common feeling about agreeing or strongly agreeing with that equity goal. Um, so at the top, you see what we heard from all respondents, and that does include the student survey responses, and then the different um, um, uh, demographic groups. And so I also want to just note that we heard from more than 2,000 people um, who provided additional thoughts uh, on, and, on transportation and why they disagree or agree with that equity goal. And so here are a few thoughts from people who disagreed or strongly disagreed with the equity goal. Um, these uh, quotes have been edited for grammar and punctuation only, um, and they all come from respondents who identified themselves as a person of color. And here are a few thoughts uh, from people who agreed or strongly agreed with the equity goal. And so again, quotes are edited for grammar and punctuation. Um, because we heard from so many people, we are still in the process of coming through those comments. Um, and we'll be sharing these in greater detail to our transportation partners. And you may see them reflected in projects moving forward. So bottom line, what did this actually cost to do? Uh, and I just want to note that in this table, this does not include the cost of staff time. This is just the cost for um, actually administering the survey, uh, getting the paper or the, the postcards out, um, getting the translations done, et cetera. And about 80% of that cost, uh, total cost, which is just over $45,000, is associated with that postcard bailing. Um, other survey costs include additional pr printing for mailers, posters, and paper surveys. Joe, I see your hand up. Yeah, I can, oh, I'm muted here. Oh, sorry. Um, you mentioned earlier on, now on the comments that mainly those were um, people of color that were making those comments mm -hmm. and agree. On the next page, I was wondering, were those also people of color? They were, yes. So one of the things that we did, because we have all that demographic information, we can pull out um, the comments that we hear specifically from different demographic groups. So that's just an example of that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it costs about $45,000 to, to just uh, do the survey. Again, it doesn't uh, include the cost of staff time in putting together the survey and, and sending things out and putting you know all that good stuff, analyzing the information. Michael, I see your hand up. You're muted. Michael, you're muted. Sorry about that. I thought I'd unmuted. Hey, uh, sorry, I don't mean to get you off point, Katrina. Good, good presentation. Uh, a question about the Spanish translations. 
Was that the only language options or were there other language options? So that was the only language that we proactively translated into Spanish or translated. Um, but as part of our Title VI program, people are um, welcome to ask for additional tra translations into other languages. Um, Great, thank you. Yep. So as we are talking about uh, where do we go from here, that we have some questions that we need to consider. So one of them is how cost effective is it to administer a survey the way that we did? I think another one is really how can we improve outreach to those who speak a language other than English? I think it's one thing to say, we'll translate something for you if you want it. It's another to proactively do that. Um, and it's another thing to have the, the trust built up in, in the community to uh, make them feel comfortable enough to participate. Another question is, have we done enough to remove bias introduced in the data by using demographic responses? So, you know, I, I went through a lot of how we can pull out and tease out what different demographic groups, um, how they respond differently based on different demographics. And that's how we are trying to pull out um, those differences and make up for the fact that we are here not hearing from everyone um, in a comparable way in our community. Uh, so if we can pull out those specific responses, we can tease out those differences. But is that enough? Are there other things that we need to do? And I'm sure there are other questions that you might have or that we, we have about how, move, how to move forward from here and other ways to improve our outreach to our community. Um, so that's something that we're gonna be thinking about as we continue uh, moving through this. So what are we gonna do with those survey results? Um, as I mentioned early in the project or earlier in the presentation, you know, our primary concern was really about the call for projects. And we saw some benefit to the Capitol campus with a uh, commute trip reduction and, and just the impact of COVID and telework on our community. But we also identified as we met with staff internally that there are eight other projects where we can utilize this information. And this is a little bit of a different approach uh, for us as an agency. Typically when we do a survey, it's geared towards one, maybe two projects, <laughs> excuse me. But in, in this instance, we have a rich variety of places where we can utilize this information to inform the work that we're doing. And some of these uh, projects are part of our core work program, while others are projects that we work on with partners. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to answer any other questions you guys might have. Uh, Katrina, I, I have one that may be kind of off the wall. As you're doing these kind of things and you're talking about translations for other language speakers, I, I would just preface that people who are non-English speakers are probably also non-English readers. So how do we get the information to them that they can request a translation in another language. Yeah, and so I will just say that we, uh, again, in, in Thurston County, English, or sorry, yeah, English, Spanish, Korean, and Vietnamese are the four most commonly spoken languages. So we did have a, a information on the website saying we'll translate it into another language in those languages. Um, but it is still a whole. And so that is where our community partnerships come into play. So we have uh, a number of organizations in our community that work with uh, non-English speaking populations. And that is maybe a method that we can foster more in the future. We did reach out to a number of those groups, but you know, we feel that our, our work is really important and it is, but that it's not necessarily the focus of these other organizations. And so that, that has, can be a barrier to some extent. And so finding ways to bridge that gap is going to be really important as we continue to look for solutions to that. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards. Uh, yes, sir. Say so just, uh, I'm always concerned that uh, special interest groups sometimes have, uh, I don't know, bigger voice or could affect any of these surveys uh, that we move forward in. And, and 
You know, the one thing that I think probably makes everybody pay attention is when you uh, say something about how we spend their money, how we spend their tax dollars. Like, uh, if there was some way that through, I don't know, some other notifications, and maybe you've, you've done these, Katrina, or, or thought of those, or there's a reason to or not to, but like uh, a property tax notice or a driver's license renewal, bank statements, phone bills, power bills, that kind of thing, that we could sit, li slip some little thing in that uh, would just basically say, uh, would you like to comment on the way we spend your tax dollars? And then maybe a little website or an address or a phone number. And I know that would take cooperation with those different entities might, that might be involved there, but I think it might give us a broader spectrum of response because especially, I mean, you get a property tax notice. Well, everybody's fired up when they get that, obviously. And uh, then, you know, they might go ahead and uh, go to that website or call that phone number or whatever uh, the other means of communication would be. So just, just that is a point of interest for me. So. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, you know, I, I just want to point out again that uh, we, we did actually have a mailer in Rainier and Tonino's water bills, and we're appreciative to those communities for supporting this survey in that way, because that helps us uh, get the word out to them. Michael Kate. Yeah, thank, thank you again. Katrina, good, good, good presentation. Um, really, really got my mind going in a number of ways. One of the questions we've been talking, we, things we've been talking about is access to the survey. And I'd love to work with you in the future about how other groups that traditionally don't have a voice, either it's uh, any, even a language, I'm talking about groups that represent individuals that typically don't have access to survey. And mm -hmm that maybe are mobility bound or mobility restricted, not necessarily from physical, but maybe some other barriers. So groups like Morningside, I'd love to have them brought into the fold and brought into the conversation about how do those individuals um, that have those long-term disabilities um, use the transportation system, use our infrastructure, because that's a, that's a great way to build those connections and get that extra input. So let me know if I can help in any way. It's more of a comment than a question, but, um, I really like the way that, and also I've been working with uh, the good folks over at St. Martin's University on a number of how they uh, institutionalize and kind of academic create, create an academically um, defensible survey. I know you've done that work, but um, there's some good stuff there too, as well as for opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. So Helen Wheatley and then Hillary Seidel. Thank you. Yeah, I might be, uh, I might be jumping into Hillary's space, but uh, I noticed that, uh, I mean, you got really good feedback from reaching out to the two, just the two high schools, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed to me, you know, the, the, the pictures went by quickly, but it looked to me like if you subtracted from the over 55 group and moved that to the uh, under 24 group, um, including, you know, if you were to think about how quickly kids grow up, you know, the ones who are under 10 are not going to be <laughs> under 10 that much longer. Um, is there a way to think about expanding that outreach effort? Because it seems to me that, that schools are a really good avenue to reach, um, you know, not only the kids, but their parents too. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I will caveat um, those student survey responses because depending on the school district, they were administered a little bit differently. And so if you actually read through the comments, you can tell on some of those that the parent is filling it out on behalf of their child. Um, so, you know, I think we always have a desire to reach out to our student population. Um, and I, I've had great success working with a number of different school districts, and I don't think that that's going to stop anytime soon. But we also have to be sensitive to uh, the needs of the schools. This again, this is this is a perfect example that um, this is important to us, and it's it's it affects them and is important to them too. But they have so many other responsibilities that um, it's going to be always a, a need for us to to contact and reach out. 
Mark, I saw your hand. Yeah, I would just like to comment on that too, because um, I heard from some of the school districts that, that weren't able to push it out uh, is our, timing wise, it was difficult because we were doing this survey at the same time all the school districts were trying to figure out how to get kids back to school. And so to say it was a busy time is an understatement. And there was also, a, there were a number of surveys going out from the school districts to parents. And there was some concern of just information overload. And so um, we understand the, 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 the challenges there. And it was, um, I think, far more an instance of circumstance in terms of the school districts that weren't able to get out the survey rather than what would normally occur. It just happened to overlap with an incredibly challenging time for all of our school districts. Robin Vasquez. Morning. Uh, Katrina, first off, amazing work on the survey and excellent presentation so far. I wondered, if memory serves, state agencies who have ETCs were also invited to participate in the survey? Yes, so we, we sent an email to the ETCs um, and they were, they distribute it to their, their staff that they were, or the staff members that they represent. So yes, we, we took advantage of that one too. Good. I know that my agency sent it out and invited people to participate. I was gonna share as we're talking about just, first of all, I think that the representation that we got from groups that normally are underrepresented in our survey efforts is amazing. Like it's really, really impressive. So thank you for sharing the demographic data and all the work that you and your staff did. There are um, affinity groups within the state of Washington that I think we may be able to connect with next year if we want to kind of lean in even more and try to get those groups that might not always have access to surveys or might not always take surveys. There are several that represent people of color, people with disabilities, people from other marginalized backgrounds. So that might be an opportunity to do like targeted outreach in the future for state employees, but state employees that have self-identified as being from those communities. Thank you. Hillary, I see your hand is up still. Do you have another comment or question? Oh, I haven't made a comment yet, but I would like to or ask. Okay, you please. Um, so first off, I want to just take a pause to appreciate the presentation, and I want to call out a few things in particular um, in line with our recently adopted um, value statement. One of the most important things that we can do to lead for equity is to be really honest and transparent about our data. And so really giving us a clear picture of where there is disproportionality in the survey results helps us lean into and understand the survey results better. It doesn't mean we can't use them, but it means that we go into that work knowing the limitations of the results. So thank you for um, modeling that best practice. Um, Katrina, I really appreciate it. Um, and sometimes those are hard conversations to have because it's clear that people worked really hard to make this survey accessible. And I think that we did have great results, but we know that surveys in general, especially online surveys, do have limitations. And like most online surveys, we saw older white participants overrepresented. And I think if we look back at some of our methods for um, promoting the survey, we kind of can see some little breadcrumbs as to why that is the case. We know that older white voices are more strongly represented in conversations about multimodal transportation. Well, that was a population we tried to push the survey out to. We know that older white voices are more represented in conversations about climate change. Well, that was a population we pushed the survey out to. So we're also limited by who our own relationships are with. And so I think that one of the things we can do as an organization is really work to support staff in um, helping to facilitate and develop those relationships with lots of different community partners so that um, we can look to community partners, not just to administer surveys on our behalf once a year, but to be real partners going forward in the work. Because sometimes the survey just isn't going to work. A better strategy may be sitting down with a group of community members for a listening session. And that's something that we have started to do a lot in, in school environments. And so I'm sure that um, my fellow um, school board rep or school district representatives could share about that work as well. Um, 
But one other thing I wanted to mention about the um, student piece, which is something to consider, and Helen, you will never step on my feet by talking about young people. I love it when everybody talks about young people, is that um, schools do a lot of surveying already. And we, we actually do collect demographic data about how students respond to our surveys. And so one thing we might think about doing is crosswalking the information that we're looking for as a larger organization with information that our school districts are already collecting. So for example, most school districts administer some sort of a um, school climate um, survey that talks about a whole host of issues like um, students' um, feelings of hopefulness or um, progress towards particular goals they might have. Most districts also participate in the statewide healthy youth survey, which asks specific transportation questions. Um, <clears throat> that's all middle school and high school students for the healthy youth survey. And that particular survey is cohorted, which means that the same group of students takes it every other year for the entire time of their middle school and high school career. So you can actually, if you're a jurisdiction, you can look at where you've made investments, maybe when a student was in sixth grade, and see if those investments have made a difference for that cohort's behavior by the time they're in 12th grade. So those would be some areas where we could probably do some deep collaboration, and it might not be about pushing out another survey, but looking for opportunities to crosswalk what we're trying to find out about students. So, um, and we can talk more about that um, later. I'm a huge proponent of the Healthy Youth Survey because I think it's just an amazing and underutilized tool. So, but thank you so far for all the awesome work. Thank you, Hillary. Any other questions or comments? Katrina? I've got nothing unless you guys have questions. Oh, actually, you know what? I do want to say one more thing. Um, so in addition, so we, again, we heard from about 4,200 people. Uh, we had comments from more than 2,000 people, written comments that were combing through. And we also received about 1,000 different emails um, from people who are interested in hearing about transportation issues in the community. So, um, you know, all of this is, is kind of helping us broaden our, our understanding and our ability to reach out to people who want to hear more. Michael Cade. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is, I don't mean to drag out the conversation, but um, one of the things that maybe in the future, as we talk about surveys and information that you're gleaning from the community, is how you use that information or TRPC uses that information to coordinate um, conversation and planning sessions with the counties that surround us. Um, and I know that we have a relationship with the PSRC, but um, you know the economy and the communities have changed so much in the last couple of years. And um, I think that would be helpful conversation for us to get a synopsis of how you dovetail these, this information with what's going on around us and how it relates. So, but thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? All right, if not, Karen Parkhurst will talk to us about our legislative update. Sorry, I'm going to request that we talk about the previous subject just for a minute, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. And that is that um, we are updating the Human Services Transportation Plan this year. And we are also updating our outreach on our Thurston Here to There. And that's a website that helps people figure out how to get around in our community. As part of both of those efforts, we're going to be reaching out to uh, communities who, because of age, income, ability, may have challenges in transportation. So I consider all of you volunteers to help me find those organizations within your community that we can reach out to. And the whole idea is saying, what transportation services are provided, what do you need, what's the gap, and then um, it would um, hopefully translate into uh, funding for some of those projects. So um, this- Karen, Oh, yes. just briefly, could you briefly uh, tell folks what the Human Services uh, Transportation Plan is, just because that sure. the name isn't obvious on that one. Okay, um, so it is, it's a requirement by um, 
state DOT that we that we fill out this that we update this plan. And as I was saying, it talks about the needs and gaps and possible solutions for people who because of age, income or ability might have transportation challenges. So it is also used uh, and has a prioritized project list in it that you will be making decisions on later this year. And the prioritized project list, you must be on that list to qualify for certain funding programs through the Department of Transportation at the state level. And so um, it's, it's a complicated piece. I will say that Washington State was the first state um, to create this plan. And now it has been accepted by the feds and everyone has to do it. So it was the innovation of Washington State that said we need to better understand um, the issues that people have. In the past, we have had some focus areas on looking at the military population and if there were special needs. Um, for example, retired military may have more need to be going up to uh, Joint Base lewis McCord or American Lake than others. So we focused on that in one of our um, updates. We also looked at disaster uh, recovery in another one to say, how are people with special needs? How do we know where they live if there is um, some kind of a natural or otherwise disaster and reach them? So you will be hearing from me in the next couple of weeks saying, how can you help us with those affinity groups? And I do agree, Hillary, we have had the opportunity to put questions on the Healthy Youth Survey, tailor a couple of questions to transportation in the past, and that is very interesting information. And um, so we'll continue to do that. So there's my help us um, part of my request today. Uh, any questions on that? If not, I'll go into the legislative piece. So I do not have a PowerPoint presentation today. We're on day five of the 60 day legislative session. So um, I will tell you or just remind you that all of the bills that were alive last year are still in play this year. So um, and 500 bills were um, put in sort of the uh, pre pre-session um, pre-filed bills section. So there's a lot of interest in the legislative session this year. As you can imagine, many of the bills that they are dealing with um, right now and have taken action on in one of either the House or Senate really are dealing with COVID. Um, and so for example, they just re removed the age requirement for joining the Washington Guard used to say you had to be under this age. Now you don't have an age restriction. So any of you that would like to join the national, the state guard, you could do that. The other piece is, and this is in the medical profession, there's many, many rules in the medical profession that talk about who has the authority to do a certain medical task and who could you delegate that authority to. So a bill apparently a nurse could not delegate to an assistant the ability to do glucose monitoring in the hospital. And with all of these um, uh, blood sugar monitoring, with all of these um, shortages, we're having to fix some of those things. So again, not relative to your legislative issues, but that's what we're seeing in the first few days of this is really COVID related. You'll remember that um, our priority issues, thanks to you, are limited to two groups this year. One is transportation around I-5 and continuing the work that we are doing, uh, working with the Nisqually tribe, working with Joint Base Move McCord, working with others to really look at um, our I-5 situation, the environmental parts of it, as well as other parts of misfunction on it. So as part of that one, we're asking for funding to keep that going. We are also asking for uh, the roundabouts in the Yelm area because that is such a major uh, requirement for when something happens on I-5. We also have language in there about continuing to look at transportation demand management measures, such as encouraging people to ride the bus or to telework. Um, 
to make that happen. And we emphasize the multimodal nature of our transportation system. Um, in working with legislators, one of the things that we have talked about is this, it's and. We want to deal with people who are driving and we need to deal with people who are riding transit and using their bicycles. So it's not a either or. And uh, the other priority the issue deals with broadband. There have been at least almost 10 bills, I think there's like nine, um, who have been, which have been introduced to broadband. So that has been the, the awareness of the importance of broadband for everyone um, is just been made so clear to all of us. So you remember our ask is more funding for broadband, but it is also um, that when there's grant funding available, um, at the state or federal level that at the state level, we have a community process so that we're not, um, so that we continue to work together. Mark is part of uh, the local group that's dealing with broadband and coordinating those efforts. So let's, um, you know, uh, stay coordinated on those. So those are our two pieces. We have meetings set up with uh, legislators. We're continuing to hear back. Um, we, we've had uh, meetings set up for some time and uh, at least three of those have canceled and be, been rescheduled. So it's a typical work first week of session. Just so you know, um, Clark Gilman from this, your council uh, is uh, involved in those legislative meetings. The Andy Ryder, chair of our Transportation Policy Board and mayor of uh, Lacey is involved in those. And Renee Radcliffe Sinclair, who is the executive director of TBW, a former representative, um, is a business representative on the Transportation Policy Board. And she is the other person that goes to these meetings. And so we have kind of a business voice as well as uh, folks from both the council and the policy board. So. Um, I think it would be great if you know of legislation that may be of interest. Again, we are focusing on those, those two things, I-5 and the surrounding issues and broadband, but that doesn't mean I don't have a tracker because you didn't stop caring about um, homelessness. You didn't stop caring about affordable housing or climate issues. And so we're tracking those sort of in a monitoring way and we'll bring those to you. So let me know if there's stuff that you're watching that we can be helpful on. And, um, you know, it's going to be quick. Um, the problem with the short session is they don't have to wait for introduction. They have thousands of bills to deal with and they are dealing with them. Um, it is all remote um, and uh, there's disagreement on whether that works well or not. Um, and so you know, I think we all want to be out of the pandemic so that we can go back to normal, whatever that means. Um, but I must admit that not having to park to go up to this legislative session um, is really helpful. And so that makes me think of those people who live in other parts of the state that might have to um, get childcare and um, incur transportation expenses to come over here. So I, I think we'll probably end up with a hybrid model. So that's what I know our representatives and senators are very thankful that we have limited our um, um, issues so that they can help move them forward. So any questions? If not, then I- Commissioner Edwards. Yes. And then, and then Helen Wheatley. Okay. Uh, Karen, uh, you mentioned one of the things you mentioned was the telework and how they're trying to figure out is that going to work or not, I suppose. Is there a lot of interest in that? And where I'm coming from is expansion of office space. I, I see all these empty uh, parking lots around all the state buildings, the courthouse, uh, city hall, you know. So I, I think it's so important from our perspective of planning the future needs you know is this going is telework going to become so common that we better rethink what we're doing so i'm just asking that kind of as a as an open question are you seeing any any specific areas of concern over telework 
We are actually seeing a lot. And uh, in addition to the other things that we do, we are the lead agency for commit to production on behalf of Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater, and Thurston County, for those of you who didn't know that. And this is a state law that basically requires large work sites and all state work sites within our urban grower areas in Thurston County to um, encourage people uh, and put um, information to them and sometimes incentives out to encourage people to do other than just driving by themselves. So we have seen some interesting things happen at the state level. We are focusing, in addition to the commuter production plan, we also just finished phase one and are in phase two of a capital campus telework study. So as part of that, we have been gathering information about parking. We had um, uh, counts on the freeway, counts in Olympia of what happens when state employees travel differently. And so um, the state government has um, initiated a program for paying for your, tra uh, your parking by the hour. Um, I don't know if you know this, but basically um, seas of free parking encourage people to drive. When you have to pay for parking, then you might think about it. And when you have to think about it every day because you're paying every day, <clears throat> then you might think, well, wait a minute, I telework for three days a week, therefore. So we are working nationally, internationally and at the state level with it. It has been fascinating to watch. And again, our focus has been on state agencies um, that there isn't an answer. There's a lot of desire by management to have people come back to the office, but when asked why, and a lot of employees are asking why, there doesn't seem to be uh, a simple answer for that. And so I think we're fluctuating. If I were to go across state government, we still have um, state agencies that say, everyone can telework as much as they want, this works. And we're investing in the technology to do it. And by the way, what does this mean about parking? Um, and others that have said you must be in the office full time or you must be in the office three days a week. So um, something that's really interesting to watch, we are not involved except as observers, but there are some, uh, there are some buildings on the Capitol campus that need to be replaced um, because of safety issues. And there's a discussion right now about do we have to add more parking? When we add state agency buildings, typically we would add more parking. Um, but do we really need to when their parking is so underutilized right now? Um, it's complicated by the fact that one of these buildings is a Senate office building. And so, um, you know, senators perhaps need to be able to have access to their cars uh, quicker than others. So I'm giving you a lots of words. We're looking at it, <laughs> Commissioner Edwards, and we don't have an answer. I think the other part is um, the Economic Development Council um, put together a report on the financial impacts of having session uh, remote on downtown Olympia, on our community, on those people that rent houses to legislators when they're in town, our restaurants, our hotels. And it was, amazing the amount of money that was lost with that. So the whole telework thing and parking and building facilities uh, is an ongoing piece. In state government, um, at least three agencies that I can think of are making decisions to, cons to close office buildings and consolidate into one. Uh, Department of Transportation in downtown Seattle has let go of a lease. Um, and uh, others are. And this whole parking thing is really gonna be fascinating. How much are we willing to spend to invest in a vehicle <clears throat> space that sits all day? And um, especially if people aren't gonna be there that often. So lots of circles um, that are going on. I don't have an answer, but we're absolutely paying attention to it. Okay, thank you very much. Good breakdown. Thanks. <laughs> Helen. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I feel like I'm talking a lot today, which I don't usually do. So my apologies for that. But I did, um, I did attend the Growth Management Policy Board um, meeting. I think it was last week. I can't remember now. Um, and uh, legislation was a big part of the discussion for that meeting. And I just wanted to draw attention to a couple of things. Um, uh, there, there could be a couple of areas of really strong emphasis that could have an impact on how Thurston County approaches its growth management revision, you know, the revisions yes. um, that are coming up. Um, because there's a lot of emphasis on climate and on salmon recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, maybe you have a sense of, Karen, of, of how that's going so far, but it could have a real impact because it could place new requirements on um, on how the revisions are are done. Um, but also, there's it looks like there's going to be some opportunity for funding of local implementation. That's but what. Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on those bills. And like I said, there's also one about uh, more tribal uh, um, consultation in growth management. There's a couple about sort of growth management in the fringes. There's one about schools and uh, where they cite schools. So there's a, a, a good handful of bills. And uh, I will, add, those are on my tracker of not our most important issues that we have determined for this session, but as things we're keeping an eye out for. And so I'm, I'm gonna spend some time this weekend updating our tracker and, um, send it out to you it's huge there's you know hundreds of bills on it but it is categorized by category so you can look at um, bills that deal with growth management and what that looks like so yeah but keep me informed that's really helpful to hear what future sound regional council is doing as well okay thank you karen sure moving on it is time for the executive director's report Thank you, Chair. Um, I do have a, a, a number of things to, to make sure folks are aware of. First of all, um, just a reminder again, if, for any entities that haven't already, um, please send Berlina Lucas uh, information on who your primary member and your alternates are gonna be uh, for 2022 for, for council and for TPB if that hasn't been done yet. Um, I wanna make sure that uh, our local agencies re report road damage from the recent flooding. There was an emergency declaration, and so there's a there's a process for reporting damages to Washington State Department of Transportation um, to make sure that uh, any of those damages might, can be uh, potentially recouped through emergency relief funding. Uh, so I'm sure that your public works folks are aware of that, but just a a reminder because that's an important opportunity that that has some some timelines associated with it. Um, wanted to make sure Council knew at Transportation Policy Board earlier this week, we had an opportunity to thank um, Graham Sackerson for his longtime service uh, to the region and to the Transportation Policy Board. Uh, Grant had uh, Graham had most recently been serving as a community representative. Um, and uh, decided to, to step down at the end of his term. And so we had an opportunity to say thank you for many, many years of contribution to the region. So when you see Graham, give him a thank you as well. Um, they also, uh, Mayor Pete Komet was off of Transportation Policy Board um, for all of a half month. Uh, he, the, the Transportation Policy Board uh, elected him as an emeritus member. This, is, this was uh, something that was established in transportation policy bylaws a couple of years ago, and it's in recognition of, of people with uh, 10 or more years of consecutive service on Transportation Policy Board. Um, are eligible for this emeritus representative position where they'll be voting uh, members for the first two years of that emeritus term, and they can be re-upped uh, for additional 
two one-year terms as non-voting members. And so uh, Mayor Pete Komet is still on the transportation, or I should say former mayor. I'm sorry, I have such a tr trouble with uh, losing the, the, um, the, the, the monikers for people. Um, so Pete Komet is now the emeritus representative um, for Transportation Policy Board. Um, we are, and this came up today, today as well, we are working with the Transportation Policy Board and our Technical Advisory Committee on updating the call for projects process. We, we mentioned that, that earlier, but we'll be bringing the, the discussions and proposal for an updated call for projects process. This is for the distribution of the federal funding that council programs out. And as was mentioned earlier, our next call for projects, we're expecting to be in fall of 2022. So prior to that, uh, policy board and council will be looking at and council will be taking action on uh, an update to our call for projects process. Then I also wanted to um, congratulate Thurston Public Utilities on receiving almost 63,000 from uh, Washington State Department of Commerce to install solar arrays on their admin and operations building. Um, great opportunity to get those funded through the state and uh, helps with our regional climate mitigation goals. So congratulations to the PUD on that. And with that, I will close my report. Chair, thank you. Thank you. And so at this time, we will go into member check-in. Anybody who would like to comment on what's going on in their particular jurisdictions, please feel free. Wow. Hillary. Thank you. Uh, just a heads up, we will have a um, technology and safety levy on the ballot in February. And um, for those of you who don't know a whole lot about school funding, schools can run um, maintenance levies or capital levies. This is a capital levy. And so we um, run this levy every four years to make sure that our technology is up to date and we can provide high quality connectivity for um, our students. Something that was a real benefit to us when the pandemic hit because we had miraculously thought ahead to invest in a whole bunch of hotspots. So when we had students who could not access internet, we had hotspots to give out. Um, but this levy is unique because it also includes a lot of safety investments and several I think that would be of interest to this group one is that there's a um, component of it that um, accounts for some uh, redundant energy production through solar panels in case of emergency, but also we continue to try and add as many solar arrays as possible to our buildings. Many of them are already outfitted, ready for solar, um, and we just continue to sort of aggressively look for those partnerships. And then the other piece is... Um, about $2 million of this levy will go to improving walking and biking routes to and from school. We recognize that those kinds of small scale projects are often really difficult for jurisdictions to undertake, um, even though we know that everybody's committed to safety getting to and from school sites. And so we hope that this levy, if it passes, will enable us to um, it, uh, improve those walking and biking routes for everybody who needs to get to and from school, whether they are attending or just visiting campus. Thank you, Hillary. Mel Murray. I just second what Hillary said. Tim Water School District also is running a cap a four year capital levy in February, but we didn't think to include sidewalks, but which is a great idea. Any other comments, Helen? Yeah, here I am again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, the, the Conservation District has an election coming up. I want to remind people about that. Um, and uh, the deadline for filing as a candidate is January 21st. So I wanted to make sure that, that everybody was aware of that. And then the election will be March 15th. Okay. Carolyn. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to let share one interesting thing from inner city transit. Um, <clears throat> we authorized our general manager to um, execute a contract for um, <clears throat> transit bus air purification solution. And the neat thing about this in the, in the age of COVID here 
is that this system is it promises to filter out 95% of viruses and pollutants on the bus. And in a day when, you know, everybody's trying to be super careful, I just thought that was something important to share with you, as well as kind of an update on that we have now reached 80% of pre-COVID service levels in terms of the routes that we run. So, you know, <clears throat> trying to rebuild that and hire more operators in order to make that happen. But those are the latest. And I also want to just point out one other thing. It won't be official until next week, but you heard Robin Vasquez, our newly elected Lacey City Council member, um, come in on, on this meeting. And it's looking as if she will be Lacey's representative to TRPC. So just a heads up on that. Thank you, Karen. Sure. Anybody else? Okay, well, it looks like it's that time. I would just like to say thank you for the opportunity to serve. It's always nice to be with everybody. And you have a great month and start of the new year. And I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Once again, excellent job. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Council Dennis. Member McBay, for, for cheering. <laughs>